Anyway, that was a very, very, really interesting talk, Jim. And I, I, it's, there's part of me that would just like to carry on with some of the points that you made. But this talk is dedicated to Pierre. Pierre came up to me and said, uh, he wants me to talk a whole hour on protein folds. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He wanted to hear a little bit about symbiosis, so I thought on some of the topics that I haven't covered, uh, the one that would probably best segue into what Jim was talking about was to talk about the origin of eukaryotes. And so that's what I'm going to do. And, and I'm going to do it in a, probably a very abbreviated way because I have... There's, Part of my life, I've actually given four or five hours of lectures on the origin of eukaryotes and complexity uh, because it is such a, a big point. And a lot of this has been in response to Peter Ward because I am in, not in agreement with him. And as you'll see, I think the formation of eukaryotic cells is fairly easy. And I'll point out, the whole thing about eukaryotic cell evolution has more to do with timing. And I'll mention why that timing is important rather than process. So, let me see, get this. So I was going to start out with lecture 9, 9A and 9B, and, and this was my initial idea was to follow, uh, follow Jim and, and look at the probability of acquiring life elsewhere and, and an origin of eukaryotes, building on the Drake equation. So I was going to show the Drake equation where uh, it, which is basically the probability of intelligent life somewhere else. What's the probability of finding a planet with intelligent life? And I would take two or three of the uh, constructs that are found in that uh, probability, uh, part of his probability equation, and try to, to work with that. So are there enough known parameters that we can actually construct the probability equation for origin of life, uh, even on an Earth-like uh, planet? and what is required to get a eukaryotic cell, and what are the probabilities that we can acquire that, et cetera. And when I was thinking about this, I could take all four of these and list some things that I know for sure, but I can also list a lot of things I don't know, so that I have no probability for them. So let's go to lecture 9B. I'm skipping 9A. This is, this is the uh, Pierre lecture. Uh, so it's the origin of eukaryotes. And what I want to do with this is talk about the endosymbiosis, uh, endosymbiosis theory for the origin of eukaryotes, which is the, the accepted theory, and I'll tell you why it is. And then say a little bit about symbiosis today and give a couple of examples, since all of you know that I like to show an animal or two so that we can relate to something that's actually living here on occasion. And then the early stages in the formation of eukaryotes, I want to point out, is not a rare event. And I want to point out why I don't think it's a rare event. So just to educate you a little bit, I've mentioned most of these. But before we can actually start talking about the origin of the eukaryotes, let's look at some of the differences between our cells and bacterial and archaeal cells. One I talked about quite a bit, which is the unity of biochemistry and the genetic code. We're all basically the same. Uh, we have the same code, we use the same amino acids, we have the same uh, energetic pathways that bacteria, archaea, slime molds, and even hagfish have, you know. Um, That's why you can eat the slime. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think the... If most of you have one memory from my lectures, it will be that hagfish slime. <laughs> uh, so, and eukaryotes, it's another difference, have multiple chromosomes. So they have lots of genetic material. Prokaryotes have a single. Eukaryote genomes are full of non-coding DNA and genes encoding RNA. So for example, we have a lot of these uh, genes that really emanated from RNA viruses. And in fact, there are animals that have over a thousand small chromosomes, and over and we have 40, 40, 43, and the majority of them of these chromosomes are just viral. And so this is a concept of selfish genes. Uh, we reproduce those genes, but most of them don't transcribe into anything. So even in us, we have a lot of 
non-coding DNA, uh, but are capable of, of uh, encoding RNA. It's, a, I think, a remnant of some really interesting RNA world and <laughs> RNA viruses. Uh, our kind of cells, eukaryote, translation and transcription, that is, uh, translating the genetic material and transcribing it into protein, are both separate. Whereas in uh, organisms like us, I mean, by bacteria and et cetera, they happen at the same time in the same place. The reason is eukaryotes, the nucleus is covered in a membrane. So that when they make, when they translate that into RNA, in order to actually, uh, I mean, uh, transcribe it into R uh, RNA, it has to be translated into protein outside of the nucleus. So there's a cycle where the nuclear membrane is decomposed and then proteins are synthesized with the uh, ribosomes which are outside of the nucleus. So it's a complex cycle. Uh, eukaryotic information genes, that is their DNA, their chromosomes, or archaea. We know that. And that's an important point in what I'll be talking about. The operational genes for the most part are bacteria. So we are a combination of archaea and bacteria. And that's going to be a very key point when I discuss, I think, what I call the ease of actually getting to uh, a higher organism. As eukaryotes evolved, most of the genes that they have do not have any prokaryotic homologs. So whereas a lot of the operational and information genes we can trace, the majority of genes that eukaryotes have, like us, are something that evolved with a eukaryote. And that's the complexity issue. And, and we'll talk about that later. And we don't have to... Archaea are really interesting because and you, there's a reason why they adapted very rapidly, very early on in Earth history, is they're adapted to energy stress. And they can make do with very, very low levels of energy. So I've shown, we've shown you a lot of universal phylogenetic trees. Uh, this is what it really looks like. It's not a simple tree. There's been, in early Earth history, a lot of interaction between all the organisms, exchanging genes, etc. And so what this means is that we've had mechanisms for exchanging genes across all the three domains of life. Uh, so this is something that occurs very uh, 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 abundantly. And so it's not just uh, you know, a, simple, a simple system. Why we can use the ribosomal RNA that we've been showing you as a tree is because that gene, or the genes involved in the ribosome, are less impacted by lateral gene transfer than any other gene on the chromosome. So that there are highly conserved sites. Uh, but when you start making a protein tree, for example, a tree from another gene, you're going to see a lot of chimeric genes because of, of a horizontal gene transfer. So this is one idea about the origin uh, that actually fits in a lot of way with how you create this unity of biochemistry. You've had so much horizontal gene transfer that you're going to be selecting out very rapidly the best fit genes. So the first stages in the development of eukaryotes, which people think, is the fusion between the archaea and the bacteria. Since, as I said, the archaea has the information uh, material for us and our, our kind of cells, the bacteria uh, do all the housekeeping uh, stuff. And so there's a couple of different models uh, the Rivera Lake model that came out in 2004 is one that continues to persist. Uh, and early trees uh, or early deductions about the, the origin of, of life really came from this sort of three domain tree, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's been some other uh, ideas, and then, as I say, this. Uh, and it's basic two-empire prokaryotic, eukaryotic tree, which is really a, a, a much more older concept. Then the three-domain uh, proposal with continuous lateral gene transfer among domains is, a, is another way of, of 
deducing back here what the first eukaryote might have been like. And then the Rivera uh, lake tree really maintains these, these separate sort of uh, domains, but in a kind of a circular fashion, uh, incorporating lateral gene transfer, but preserving the prokaryotic U bacteria in the archaeal di uh, divide, but showing that eukaryotes came from bacteria and, and archaea. You'll notice that some people use archaea and some use, people use archaebacteria, and that still persists today because uh, they look like bacteria, therefore they're, they add bacteria to the, to the name. So Rivera and Lake, a fusion of bacteria and archaea to form this eukaryote, the big issue up until maybe a couple of years ago was what kind of bacteria and archaea fused and how does that actually work? And I'll give you the most, uh, the, the most recent paper that actually has still stuck today, and that's a Coxidel paper in uh, PNAS that came out in 2008. And what they did was used all the 53 proteins that are involved in transcription, translation, and replication and sequenced them. And then with bioinformatics tools, came out with what would be the, the earliest of those proteins involved in, in, in those processes. And so then they looked at the two dominant models for how this fusion occurred. So the root of the tree is somewhere here. This is the eubacteria, the normal bacteria. And then this separation of the archaea in the three domain tree, uh, and then the eukaryotes. In the three domain tree, it shows that the eukaryotes here and the archaea, both major groups of archaea, share a common ancestor here. Uh, and so there is no particularly direct link, they just share some common ancestor. Uh, and that common ancestor is the one that fused with bacteria to make eukaryotes. And this so-called eocyte tree is a little bit different. It shows that one branch of the archaea, the crenarchaeota, is actually on the route to the eukaryotes, which means you had a divide of the archaea into these two groups, and only one of these groups, the crenarchaeota, went into the eukaryotes. Now, it's kind of interesting. We've talked about archaea. The eurearchaeota contains the organisms that make methane, for example. So they're all the methanogens. It also contains those organisms that grow in very, very high salt. The organisms with the greatest number of metabolisms, however, including those that have unknown metabolisms and grow at really extreme conditions, are the crenarchaeota. So, for example, if I go into a very hot sulfide structure from a hydrothermal vent and I go into really hot zones, I find crenarchaeota that are just unknown. So, anyway, what Cox found uh, from this uh, kind of bioinformatics uh, a procedure was that the crenarchaeota, this eocyte tree, is the one that best fits the model. Okay, there have been a couple of papers since then uh, using either e even more sophisticated bioinformatics that have come to the same conclusion. So right now this tree seems to be the fusion model. Now this is fusion number one. So you actually had a crenarchaeota uh, fusing with something that actually uh, uh, formed the eukaryotes. We actually don't know the role that the U bacteria play early, early on in this. And that's because, I'll show you later, there, there is a little bit of confusion in this second phase. So the second phase of eukaryotic development is the acquisition of mitochondria and the chloroplasts. This is early symbiosis. And this also says that you, know, you need microorganisms to actually grow a eukaryote. So the mitochondria are gram-negative bacteria that probably evolved around 2.5 billion years ago. And we know a lot about the clade of organisms that make up the mitochondria. Uh, to, to help you out on this, the mitochondria are used today by higher organisms as the main source of respiration and energy production. And once some of our cells can contain hundreds and hundreds of mitochondria per cell.
the chloroplasts that make up uh, essentially give, give the uh, machinery to do photosynthesis to all higher organisms, to all eukaryotes, plants, trees, etc., originated from a cyanobacteria, as we've talked about already. Uh, and so you're not going to get a photosynthetic plants, et cetera, without this symbiosis going on with cyanobacteria. And that's been dated around 2.7. Uh, so what we're looking at is a timing issue, too. To get really complexity, we have to first evolve these groups of microorganisms. So the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis required the evolution of a Calvin-Benson cycle, which is the CO2 fixing cycle. This is one of the only CO2 fixing cycles that does not have a, a step in it that's inhibited by oxygen. So I think this is a, and what's interesting about this is that the Calvin-Benson cycle <coughs> in its reverse form, that is when it's fixing carbon dioxide and not requiring oxygen, is an ancient cycle. And so the cycle was already in place. It just needed the conditions to go in a separate, to, to go in a different way, to rather than fix CO2, to take up the organic material and make CO2. And so it's one of the reversible cycles, which makes it uh, uh, very, very interesting because some of the high temperature archaea, for example, already probably at 3.5 billion years had the Calvin-Benson cycle in reverse. So it was a matter of how you make it go in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so it was already in existence. And the mitochondria, there's some controversy about the original mitochondria. We know what group of bacteria it belongs to, but we don't know exactly what it does. Uh, right now in uh, multicellular organisms, it uses the uh, tricarboxylic acid. I am actually made, made a mistake here. The tricarboxylic acid cycle is the one that goes in reverse for respiration. The Calvin-Benson cycle uh, doesn't. What I meant to say in the Calvin-Benson cycle is that we see certain component enzymes of that in high temperature archaea, but not the full cycle. And that many of the enzymes in the Calvin-Benson cycle are, are inhibited by uh, present, uh, I mean, not in, uh, None of the, none of the uh, Calvin-Benson cycle uh, uh, enzymes are inhibited by, by uh, oxygen. So it was a cycle that was a CO2 cycle, CO2 fixing cycle. It's the only one that we know of that's not actually inhibited by, by oxygen at one point or another. The TCA cycle is the one I want to mention, which is, we think is a very ancient cycle as one that right now it takes up organic material uh, oxidizes it and makes a lot of ATP. Theoretically, you can take one uh, molecule of glucose and make up to 36 ATPs from it. It's very energy efficient, but it also went in reverse, apparently, at, at some early stage. And to put this in sort of a temporal perspective, this is a, a, a Blair Hedges paper that came out some years ago, uh, and it shows the uh, essentially some kind of a, a timing in, in billions of years uh, with the eukaryotes coming out somewhere around 2, possibly to 2.7 uh, or so, depending on, on the record. Uh, the eubacteria, as, you know, as we know it, uh, and, you know, is, I think it goes further, further down here than this particular uh, uh, model actually shows, but essentially the mitochondria may be somewhere down here, cyanobacteria here, but these anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria that I talked about earlier uh, probably come out to 3.5 or older. And so those are bacteria, so there would be some bacteria out into this, out into this region. But this is just to give you a kind of a temporal phase. And to, since I want to talk a little bit about this key step in acquiring mitochondria and chloroplast. I'll give you some idea of some single cell eukaryotes like a yeast and a centric diatom, for example. And this is a eukaryote that's sort of stylized, that it has a lot of mitochondria around it, and, and it has chloroplast. Uh, both of these, I should say, come from an endosymbiosis 
concept. So whatever this fused cell of, of bacteria and archaea looked like, at some point it picked these up. And that is when complexity really started. That's when we got oxygenic photosynthesis from plants. And that's when we had animals that can develop to actually eat things. So these are the, the models. This is the one we've talked about. Uh, model one is basically gene fusions of a bacteria and an archaea. These three models are really trying to explain the, the engulfing of uh, uh, mitochondria and bacteria. And model two, uh, the archaeon in, uh, engulfs bacterium with, within some kind of a host cell that we don't know anything about. Uh, and, and so uh, the bacteria, uh, in this case the mitochondria, uh, the archaean uh, would again be the, the uh, nucleus of the cell. In three, we have archaean engulfs bacteria. So we have an archaea that engulfs some bacteria, and then somehow it develops a new eukaryote. Uh, and then four, uh, the model, some sort of proto-eukaryote that we don't know nothing about. It's like this first cell uh, actually uh, uh, the genome with a lineage extinct, distinct, uh, distinct from archaea and bacteria engulfs the bacteria. So this would, in a sense, say that uh, we're not sure that the nucleus actually comes from archaea. Uh, this is, even since 2007, this is not really a, an acceptable idea. This one is probably the closest one. Uh, and uh, to the one, the model that people have been actually working on. And just, uh, even though I'm not talking about viruses, uh, viruses, the origin of viruses have also been put within this model and so that you actually have an archaea that also has things like viruses and, and little pieces of DNA like plasmids, small circles like this that have information on it. Uh, and uh, I mentioned transposons the other day, transferable elements. And then you have a, a, a bacterium. Again, this is the mitochondria, the alpha proteobacteria also have viruses, etc. And when they formed a prokaryotic cell, those viruses evolved to do some perhaps good things, but also uh, eventually led to the origin of viruses. So the concept here is that when an archaea and a bacteria fused together to make the first eukaryotic cell, they also transmitted viruses. And those viruses continue to evolve with this sort of proto-eukaryote and eventually formed a uh, a viral community. And I actually don't believe in that, but I I'm not, don't have another lecture to give on that. So the, the key to all this is this whole concept of symbiosis, which we can study today and make lots of inferences about uh, early life from it. It's a, a very common phenomenon in nature. And so what I'm going to do is really quickly define it and then show you some things and perhaps even a look at our future uh, from, from this symbiosis. I have to say something weird in one while. <laughs> so just to give you a little bit of an idea, symbiosis, in the newest definition, it used to be, in the newest definition, is any association between two, two or more species. In the past, it was usually regarded as a beneficial association between two or more species. Uh, the endosymbiont is an organism or symbiont that lives inside of its host, often within the host cells. So we now know that some are internal, some are external. Uh, and there are mutualists, where it's a beneficial symbiont that associates with the host but can also live apart from it. And we see this, for example, in leguminous plants like peas and clover, etc., that require on their root structure, nitrogen-fixing bacteria to fix N2 to provide the nitrogen for the plant. Uh, as I mentioned, all eukaryotes require some form of, of, of either organic nitrogen or in the single-cell cell, uh, uh, single cell plants uh, or algae, for example, they can use nitrate, ammonia, nitrite, etc. But no, uh, no eukaryotic organism. <coughs> 
can fix N2. Only bacteria and archaea can do that. And we can go down. The other one is a parasite, a symbiont that has a negative effect on host fitness, and there's a bunch of parasites that we can talk about. I, one of my favorites is this, and this came out in 2008, is a sea slug. This is a metazoan animal that's green, and it's photosynthesizing. Uh, and so this particular organism has acquired the plastids or chloroplasts from ingesting algal food, which is primarily cyanobacteria. And these organelles then are sequestered into the mollusk digestive epithelium where they photosynthesize for months and sometimes for years uh, with, without actually having the nuclear cytoplasm. And it was a big puzzle because there's a lot of ancillary genes necessary to make this work. And so the genes supporting photosynthesis are in the animal's nucleus and apparently it's been transmitted through horizontal gene transfer by viruses. So here's again a metazoan that is acquired from viruses from cyanobacteria the ability to actually use a chloroplast and be green even though we're, uh, these are metazoan animals. So this is really one of the first incidents of that. So the next step I think is green humans. And I, <laughs> I've mentioned this because, you know, as our population is increasing and we're going to be running out of food, I had one of my classes once, I said, okay, take, figure out, get a, get a general body area and calculate if we were all photosynthetic for, let's say, eight hours or ten hours, or maybe we can have sun lamps while we're working 24 hours, how much energy would that provide? And the most I got was about 10%. So what we would have to do is really increase our surface area. And that's fairly easy to do. My, my view on a surface area is a fan tail. So we would, <laughs> since we already have the root stem cell genes for that, then we could actually induce that and then modify it. So we would have this prehensile tail that can fan out. So we can send it through holes in the window <laughs> while we're talking. And it's building up energy. At the same time, think of the fashion potential with a prehensile <laughs> tail. And of course, in a crowded world, we can increase, we can actually have bars across the ceiling and, you know, students could be hanging down from their tails. We could have many dimensions. Anyway, I'm just always looking into the future. <laughs> so here is uh, this sea slug. Uh, and in, in the paper that came out in 2009, you can actually see these state that the presence of viruses in these chloroplasts and in the nucleus of the, uh, of the animal provides all the, uh, all the genes necessary to express the chloroplast. So here's a case where viruses that alter the life cycle of a solar-powered sea slug and, and this particular animal, as I said, this is a potential now, now for actually metazoans to actually uh, use, use light and become green. And it's always been a kind of a, a rule of science is that no uh, animal photosynthesize, otherwise it's not an animal. And these are a couple of other examples that are brand new, so we're seeing more and more of these of, of sea slugs that are photosynthetic. And, <coughs> This again, this uh, and uh, also a, a, a nudibranch that uh, farms colonies of brown single cell algae and then becomes uh, photosynthetic also. So we're seeing a lot of this and a, a lot, as I said, from the census of marine life, we're finding a lot of very interesting uh, innovations. And then there's some other interesting symbiosis. Uh, you can probably, you know, read this as well as I can, but this is a, a, a symbiosis mutualism of a clownfish that uh, you know, lives in uh, these coral regions and it feeds on small vertebrates uh, and that potentially could actually uh, you know, uh, harm the sea anemone that these tentacles are in and then as a result of protecting the sea anemone the, uh, the, the sea, sea anemone is, is uh, protects this guy from predators and provides food. It's a really complex interaction between, between the two animals. And we see a lot of this kind of co-evolution that occurs.
Another one is marine animals that use luminescent as part of their behavior. Most of these luminescent animals use bacteria that make light. And, and uh, I showed you that one picture of this 15 kilometer area on the ocean that was glowing. And that is what was due primarily to a bloom of light producing bacteria. Uh, and so a number of these animals, uh, mostly including this case, squid, and these are bacteria. This is the best studied, the bobtail squid is the best studied symbiosis system on, the, on Earth. Uh, this is a, a squid that in daylight goes up to feed and, be, and uh, produces light so as to camouflage itself from predators. So, so it actually produces light during the daytime. And then at night, it releases most of those symbionts and buries itself in the sediment a little bit and then comes back out day and night. And every day then it ac acquires this massive amount of organisms in this biofilm, in this little light organ. It's, it's a very fascinating story to follow it because it's the best study, but that's a whole lecture on just that animal. But there's a lot of light producers that actually have bacteria. This is the angler fish. Uh, this is a, a, a big colony of, of luminescent bacteria on here. Uh, they live in this sort of semi-dark area. And when a, a small prey comes, it doesn't see the fish, but it actually sees this. It approaches it thinking it might be something to eat. And these things, they're small fish, but their jaws are incredible. I mean, they're 90% mouth, you know. <laughs> so they think just anything can swim into it, and then they consume it. So, and there's a lot of anglerfish species. Uh, there's there's a, a, quite a number of them. So the one, one of my favorite is the flashlight fish. It has a patch of luminescent bacteria in it, under its eye. And when it closes its eye, it, it closes the luminescence. And this is, this is a group of bacteria that do this. They're also known as lantern eye fish. Uh, and the bacterium is a photobacterium species, one that I know fairly well. And so you can see in a dark environment, you can see this little glowing patch from its eye. And this is the fish. And the way they use it, uh, this, is, this is actually one of the first papers. It's a, uh, one, one of the sort of classic uh, papers. But the flashlight fish p possesses these head-like luminous organs uh, just below the eye. And on the basis of direct field and laboratory work, it's postulated that the bioluminescence is used by the fish for many different functions to assist in uh, obtaining prey to deter or escape predation and for communication. Uh, the fish also can use the light to see by. But what's interesting, this is this fish photoblepharon congregated across the, along the reef in the Gulf of a lot. There's about 30 fish, and they co congregate in schools. And if they think a predator is coming, since the fish are only about that big, if they think a predator is coming, they school and then flash their light all at once. And so they look like something a meter long. And that scares uh, you know, the predators away. So this is a, a, a really nice mechanism for doing this. So just, just some of the uh, ideas about luminescent and animal behavior. Again, this is a bacterial. Uh, uh, animal symbiosis, camouflage, avoid predation, lure prey, like in the lantern fish, they can communicate. Fireflies signal each other with light during courtship. And I mentioned the crabs that might actually, uh, the female crab in the deep sea, which is loaded with luminescent bacteria that has the ability to, to use that to attract females. So the brighter you are, the more sex you have. And so that seems to work. Uh, apparently the flashlight fish use this luminescent to see also. And this is a, 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 I just thought I'd show this. There's a place in Puerto Rico, Phosphorescent Bay, which I actually visited a couple of years ago. It has a huge number of bioluminescent algae dinoflagellates. And this is a case where they took a bucket of this and put it over a human being and he glowed. So I just wanted to show you that this. Anyway, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I just, yeah. Anyway, 
I can say something else, but I'm not. And we, we talk, we, I put this slide up the other day to show you the whale carcass, and we, we talked, somebody had wanted to know about whale falls, so I said a few things. But the point that I want to make here is that there's a lot of environments, a lot of environments that have animals that rely primarily on symbionts. Now, I, I, I can make a bold statement right now. Every animal in the ocean, and I won't say it about terrestrial, every animal in the ocean has some form of symbiosis associated with it. That's how common this phenomena is. So what I want to do is take you to uh, some of the hydrothermal vent sites and talk about one animal, which is the giant tube worm, Riptia pactella. Uh, uh, it's one of the best studied. Tube lengths could be up to about a, a 1.5 meters. They're big enough to put a leash around and have as a pet. Uh, they're not super smart, but they're interesting. Uh, they're, they're pretty commonly found. Uh, I mean, they're big enough, you know. <laughs> uh, and and they're, you know, they're fairly interesting, uh, but I'll talk about what they, looking at this, this is a big plume, it's not a mouth, and it's essentially like a big, big gill structure that pumps water down so as to get the nutrients it needs, which is primarily hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrate. These little guys here are limpets that are living and eating the food that builds up on these tubes. This is a, another form that's, uh, of the same kind of animal, but thinner and smaller, and this is prevalent in the sites that I work on on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And they can be clusters of millions of these tube worms in any one site. So this is what they do in a simple form, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide also to feed this zone here, which I mentioned is a trophosome, which is filled with bacteria that essentially convert the hydrogen sulfide by oxidizing it to sulfate, produce energy, organic molecules that feed the animal. Uh, and so it's a fairly straightforward, but it's not. I could spend three hours talking about this animal. Uh, this, if you take it out of its tube, it looks like this. So it's not real handsome outside of its tube. That's why we wear clothes. You know, um, so anyway, this is the plume, and then this is a, a area of the vestimentum, uh, the, ah, the vestimentum and collar are involved in making more tube material, and then this whole trunk area is where the uh, microbes are, which we call the trophosome, and this zone here, the opistosome, is what attaches to the rock. So it's fairly simple outside, uh, and I'm going to highlight one paper, which because it. It has a lot of information in it. The larvae of this particular animal do not have the symbiont. So when the larval form of this animal is born and released, it does not have the symbiont. And it possesses basically everything that most animals have. It has a digestive system, it has a mouth, it has an anus, it does what we do when it's in the larval stage. Uh, each generation, the tube worm then must be newly colonized with a specific symbiont. So when you get a new larval form, the object of the larval form is to find the symbiont bacteria. Uh, the new model indicates that when the symbiont colonizes a developing tube of the settled larvae, it enters through the skin, and this process occurs before the development of the trophosome. So the bacteria, when it finds a symbiont, then it triggers all sorts of things in the animal. And I'll show you some of that. And the later juvenile stages, there's what we call massive apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. This is what happens you know, in our embryology, when we go from our larval stage and then we, we uh, 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 move up into uh, the more fetal stage, we are losing all sorts of, you know, like uh, the sperm that gets incorporated is no longer involved in, in, uh, in terms of the structure is, 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 is uh, broken down. Uh, but there's a lot of different stages, and I mentioned a couple of them, for example. Uh, I'll mention a couple of them later on as to uh, what that apoptosis is. So this is a the way this has been studied is you actually can put some settle, settlement cubes down in the bottom of the ocean and you let the tube worms actually 
uh, larval stages start to colonize on them and then pick up the, they pick up the symbiont at some stage. And this is, a, for example, a very early uh, close-up of one of the settled juvenile tube worms. It's about 400 uh, micrometers with the beginning of a trophosome. So this is the early stage of that tube worm. And so this has been now modeled, and I'm just going to show you a little biology, but uh, the point is, is that this thing has a mouth, a gut, and an anus that looks very much like a, a normal animal. As soon as it gets the symbiont, and the symbiont passes through the skin, it triggers off a wide range of reactions within the cell to start producing the trophosome. And in the process, massive apoptosis occurs where it eventually loses the mouth, it loses the gut, the anus, and it just forms, starts forming the, the adult uh, form. But what triggers it is finding the right symbiont. And there's a bazillion bacteria out there, and it has only one that it has to find. And that just triggers a whole chain of reactions within the animal. But no other bacteria could do that. You can try, but no other. It's just a single kind of bacteria. And the same thing with the luminescent squid that I mentioned to you, that it takes up, when it makes its uh, light organ, it takes up thousands of different species of bacteria. But as soon as it recognizes the right species, it just kills off all the rest and, 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 and takes over. So this is a, basically a... a a way of, of imaging the, what the symbiont does or the bacteria and as they enter into the, into the cell and the trophosome is formed, the microbes that are not necessary anymore because they're taking up uh, several, uh, then they encapsulate and digest. And so the animal then takes care of all the... Does the animal survive without the symbiont? If you take it, the larva... It will, it, it will survive for approximately 30 days. So this is, that's a, a key issue because it doesn't have much time to find its symbiont and settle because it has to feed it, you know, it, it's, it's, its capacity to feed itself and to survive is, is very, very limited. And we see that in a lot of the larval stages. And so some really excellent work has been done to see how long they can survive and how far they can be transported uh, in the natural environment. So just a few conclusions about this is that uh, in later stage, uh, juvenile stages, there's this massive apoptosis. And I just wanted to point that this is really the, one of the keys. Uh, and the apoptosis of the, the, the outer muscles and undifferentiated tissue, and this is co coincident with the stopping of the colonization period. It so no, no longer takes up any kind of microbes. I just want to give you some examples of apoptosis the resorption of the tadpole tail into a frog, formation of fingers and toes, and, and us requires removal of tissues between them. In our early, some of our early stages, we have tissues between our, uh, between our fingers. The sloughing off of the inner lining of the uterus, for example, is a, is, uh, during menstruation is also an apoptosis process. And, this is, this is very interesting by the time you could lead into the whole concept of even stem cells and how that works. So just a conclusion on this, on this is that the early larval stages of tube worms feed on protists and bacteria. The symbiont along with other marine bacteria and are, uh, under the larvae through the skin and the symbiont is found in both the epidermis and in regions that eventually become the trophosome. In larvae, an extracellular substance apparently released by special <coughs> glands formed a mucus coat in which newly settled animals were embedded, and then diverse environmental bacteria, including the symbiont, colonized the mucus coat. I think after the trophosome is formed, tube worms no longer take up bacteria, and they lose their mouth and anus. Now, we don't fully understand the mechanism by which tube worms understand their symbiont and select it by, while eliminating other bacteria. We don't know anything about that. In fact, even though the symbiont is in the environment and the vents, no one using molecular techniques have been able to detect the symbiont. <laughs> we detect related organisms, but not the exact symbiont. So that's, it, it must be, I mean, it's certainly present, but it must be present fairly in fairly rare uh, uh, 
Uh, the other thing is that once the symbiont enters the, the animal, the symbiont itself changes drastically. So it no longer is capable of living on its own again. So you don't derive your symbiont from what was previously a symbiont. That organism is incapable again of, of being a free living organism. And that's been studied. It loses a number of its own genes. And that's part of what the animal does to actually slow down the ability of the symbiont to actually take over the animal cell. It actually controls it. And so they have to pick up, each larval stage has to pick up a new symbiont with each round. Uh, and how does it make a living? I, I'll just do this briefly. Bacteria produce organic nitrogen compounds. Again, I mentioned all animals require organic nitrogen. They cannot fix nitrogen, take up nitrate, use ammonia, do anything inorganic. They need organic nitrogen. And the bacteria provide that. And they provide that with amino acids, but mostly nucleotide bases. The most recent work that I've seen now, which is about 2009, is that the majority of what the uh, symbiont is producing are uh, a couple of nucleotide bases. And that the animal then uses those nucleotide bases to make not only DNA and RNA, but to through what is called a, a well, there's a, there's a special cycle that converts nucleic acids back to amino acids. So that, that's what happens. Uh, I, I don't know if I was going to cover one more animal. I, I, I'm not going to cover the symbiosis, but there's a giant clam called Calyptogena uh, that's also present in the vents. Uh, it is, has a very, very, uh, essentially no gut, but a lot of gill structure. And I only point this out because this is me dissecting one on board a ship. And I wanted to point out that it has a huge amount of blood volume. If you cut open your normal clam that you eat, you don't see a liter of blood flowing out. And, and the reason is, and in fact, you won't see red at all because most invertebrates in the ocean use a copper heme, which is essentially colorless blood. It has a lower affinity for oxygen. You don't worry about oxygen in the deep sea because it's super saturated. But in the vents, where you're trying to make a living with hydrogen sulfide, you're getting closer and closer into where there's very little oxygen. So for example, a lot of these animals are living in, in about one-tenth to one-twentieth the concentration of oxygen in the deep sea, which is over 200 micromolar. Uh, and they're living in 10 micromolar or so. So in order to compensate for that low oxygen, they have evolved iron heme, which has a much higher affinity for oxygen. And they have, they have acquired mechanisms to produce huge volumes of blood. I was really, I had, had this picture taken because I was totally surprised when I cut open and had this much blood come out. It's like cutting into a human spleen, you know. Now I'm going to show one more, which is, I think, one of the most interesting things. This is an eye, a compound eye. And it's found in a single cell dinoflagellate, single cell eukaryotic phytoplankton. This is an eye. And what is interesting about this is, first of all, it's a single cell organism with an eye, you know, which is, you know, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is pretty interesting. I mean, it sort of blew me away when I first saw this. We've seen those in cartoons all the time. You see that? I know, but that, you know, that's what you see is cartoons. But this says something fairly interesting about the, the origin of the eye, and particularly you can see the uh, uh, some of the, the ultrastructure of this sort of retina type structure, uh, the stacked membranes, which is very, very typical of, of what we see uh, in all eyes, and these large uh, pigment granules that are, that are found around it to absorb light. And I'm just going to give you the idea. This is actually a, a, a he's from, I think, Denmark, Gehring. Uh, this is his, the very first paper that he actually did, but he uses the symbiont hypothesis, but based on what we know, we, uh, the observation that an eye organelle in these, uh, these flagella-type uh, single-cell uh, plankton or, or photosynthetic organisms is located in the chloroplast, suggesting that light perception goes back to the cyanobacteria again. Uh, so the 
a proteoordopsin gene found in nostoc, and for example, is an indication. Proteoordopsin, again, I mentioned, is the pigment we use in our eye. Uh, so here again, we're seeing more things that cyanobacteria were involved in. They, first of all, they were necessary to get photosynthesis, and particularly in higher organisms. And now, potentially, they may have had the protogenes for the eye that has. Uh, that we all have. And I, if I had more time, I would talk about the origin of the eye, which I really like. But this hypothesis is also supported by some other information, <coughs> including the identification of a photoreceptor organelle and some other of these kind of uh, dinoflagellates that are as elaborate as the human eye and the one that I showed you before. So for me to actually have, if, if, you know, to see something like this in a single cell organism under the microscope and have it peering back up at me is pretty awesome. So a summary of this is that the formation of eukaryotes I think is easy. Okay, that's not rare uh, and probably occurred many, many times because I think cell-cell fusion is something that, you know, has occurred many, many times. Cell ingestion of other cells without digestion is very common even today. And you saw that in the sea slug, you know, digesting a, a, a photosynthetic organism. And symbioses are ancient processes that are still very, very common today. And, and without them, animals would not be able to live in many, many different kinds of environments on Earth uh, because they're not dealing with uh, nice, big, fat, organic nitrogen food. The timing of the emergence of eukaryotes I think was determined by the evolution of cyanobacteria and mitochondria. If, if, if cyanobacteria and the mitochondria symbiont bacteria had evolved a million years, or a billion years earlier, we would have had eukaryotes a billion years earlier. I really believe it. That's the key, to me, the limiting step was cyanobacteria and mitochondria. So the origin of eukaryotic characteristics that are not shared with bacteria and archaea have mostly unknown origins, and that's where most of the studies are today. You know, how did they acquire the kind of mitosis, meiosis, the kind of sex that they acquire, and a lot of other variables that go on in complex uh, metazoans. But to get a eukaryote, I think, is easy. And, uh, and, I, and again, I don't think it's rare to get a eukaryotic cell. It may be rare, far rarer to get complexity out of that and to get, you know, to form dinosaurs and humans, but I don't have time for that. So that's an interesting discussion. And some of you had asked what some of the uh, Cambrian explosion animals look like. These are some of the actual fossils. Uh, this is hallucinogenia right, right over here. Uh, it's, we don't know a lot of the functions, but some of the other cartoons of, of what the Cambrian looked like, they were mostly predators. Uh, and they had big eyes. This was a formation where we really see, as I said, the formation of, a, of this evolution development or the, the so-called Hox genes, which make the eye that make the, essentially the, the double-sided animals all came during the Precambrian explosion. And huge elaborate me mechanisms for predation were found in, in these animals, including you know, things like this. These are, you know, again, cartoons, but they're fairly interesting uh, uh, shapes of the Precambrian. Uh, you know, this is hallucinogenia here. Nobody really knows what this is or what it actually does. And so uh, that's why it's named after LSD. Uh, so I was just going to end again with this concept of the Drake equation, which I'm sure all of you know is and is the number of, of, of civilizations with something that can communicate with us. And Drake made these calculations, and if you read some of the early calculations where they actually put numbers in all of these, you know, they've come up with how many uh, uh, techno uh, uh, planets with uh, active technology on them there could be within any particular belts that can range from 10 to 10,000 uh, depending on how you want to make these calculations. I've always had a really difficult time with the Drake equation because anything that has anything to do with biology I can't put a probability number at all even within a factor of five in some cases you know so that makes it impossible. So 
But what I'd like to leave, you, leave all of us with, and maybe have a discussion, is thinking about probability equations for the formation evolution of life, uh, including high and, a high and low to rare probabilities. And I think it can be done. I really do. I just don't think anybody's really sat down and, and took a look at this. So the parameters for the origin of life of Earth life, for example, uh, liquid water, rocky core, metal-rich core, tectonism, uh, potential for physical and chemical cycles, for example. Uh, we can say a lot about that. And I think we can actually put some probability numbers on that. I really do. I don't know if you, you agree with that, but I think we might be. Try. Yeah. Uh, others like, you know, uh, RNA and horizontal gene transfer mechanisms, things that I've talked about, uh, we could probably do something with those also. At least get a, uh, a, it'll be a low probability, but I think we can do something with it. Life different from Earth life is something we just don't have a model for. And, and that's something that Jonathan talked about when he talked in, in Titan, which I have to admit a bias that goes with Jonathan. If I were the director of the Astrobiology Institute, that's what we would be doing today. And. Uh, Actually, you need to be the administrator of NASA. That would be more effective. Okay. <laughs> we would be mounting. And, uh, and that's something we can talk about, of, of why I think some of us would be so fascinated in going there. And then the parameters for evolution of life into more complex life, I, I think we can also at least begin to list what is necessary in order to, to understand that. Uh, and that can lead to... Uh, 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 complex eukaryotes and, 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 and complex life. Life, again, different from Earth life uh, at the higher form. You know, we, just, we only have n equals 1. If we can find n equals 2, even in the microbial world, we can find n equals 2 microbes that are not like Earth life, a separate original life, I could put, say something more about the possibility of, of complex life from that. But until we get n, n equals 2 at least, we're in trouble. And so we become and stay very Earth-centric in the way we actually think about life, its origin, and its possibility of existence somewhere else. And so as Jonathan said once before, we have to think outside the box a little bit on this. And we are the result of chance, for sure. This is, a, this is all about contingency, and that's why it's hard to put a probability in it. Had the impacts not wiped out the dinosaurs, we probably wouldn't be here. There may have been very intelligent birds, however, had we not come about. We don't know that. So I'll end with that. And uh, thanks again for all of you for being so attentive. And thank you, Pierre, for, for inviting me. And you two guys just taught me a huge amount. So I really appreciate that. I love being a student. And so I got to be that for, for a week. So thanks a lot. I can start in the back. So this uh, photosynthetic sea slug, uh, do you know, uh, because you mentioned that it eats other things as well, so do you know what fraction of its energy is capable of producing that? Uh, That's a good question, and, and the paper actually uh, uh, sort of estimates that. It could be as much as 50%. Uh, so it's very, very significant. And, uh, uh, and I think that's why it's retained. Now, I think a, a really interesting question, if it were 100%, it probably would never lose those things. I mean, that's a, that's a really nice way to make a, a living, you know, so. At the same time, being an animal, so that if you want to eat something, you know, that's, it's, it's like dessert, then eating something would be your dessert, photosynthesis would be your, your main course, you know, so. So if the, if the formation of eukaryotes um, is easy and happens also several times, so why are all eukaryotes today from a single line, and why can we not observe this in modern bacteria and archaea? Well, we can, and that's what we call the unity of biochemistry. And that's the first, you know, the first slide I put up is to mention that. Uh, the eukaryote did not form until the unity of biochemistry had happened, and that happened in the last common universal ancestor. So even though bacteria and archaea are very different, they share the same uh, 
amino acids, the same nucleotides, the same kind of energy system. And so eukaryotes evolved from from the unity of biochemistry. This question is different. Why, why don't we have other eukaryotes that have organelles derived from other kinds of bacteria? We, we actually think we do. Oh, okay. There's at least four other organelles that we actually think are derived from bacteria that I didn't talk about, but they're not found in all the animals, and they're not canonical to, to eukaryotes. So just some have picked them up and some haven't. And in fact, Lynn Margulis claims that the flagella which is a very complex flagella on eukaryotes, is, is a, a result of a symbiont of a spirochete bacteria, for example. That's very controversial. There's nothing genetic that indicates that. But she thinks that every structure, every structure in a eukaryote comes from symbiosis. And so there's, there's things like Golgi apparati and a few other things that, that we can make a strong case for symbiosis also. Related question: if, if it's easy to form a eukaryote, why did it not happen earlier? Was there some pre uh, preliminary step required, or some environmental conditions that? Uh, you know, I really think that eukaryotes, as I said, bacteria were. I mean, archaea were around by three point, maybe as old as three point eight, and so were bacteria. If you believe some of the data about photosynthetic and oxygenic photosynthesis, you had bacteria and archaea back to 3.8 billion years. I wouldn't be surprised if you had fusion of those two cells, hybrids of those two cells already uh, you know, billions of years ago. We just don't have a record of them. And, or they may have been like the, the mammals during the, the dinosaurs, little fur balls that little hit around. They just, there's no way they can actually completely com compete, but they, they were already there waiting to, to radiate. But I think it happened many, many times. And what, hasn't done, what we haven't done yet in the lab, I think I mentioned Craig Venter, I think he's probably the only one who wants to do this, but to actually form these kinds of chimeric hybrids. Uh, with different archaea and bacteria and see what happens with them. Uh, so that, that, those kind of experiments haven't been done. But I think it, that kind of fusion has to have been very, very common. You mentioned that you think cyanobacteria were necessary for the origin of eukaryotes, and so it may have been the evolving the cyanobacteria that was the slow step. Originally. I think cyanobacteria and the alpha proteobacteria, the mitochondria were really crucial. They both have to go together. Because if oxygen is really key to making the eukaryotes do something other than just be a fusion of an archaea and a bacteria, which is the first step, the key was oxygenic photosynthesis. Because that allowed the mitochondria to form. And the mitochondria is your, is your powerhouse organ. I mean, think of it. 36 ATPs from one glucose. That's huge. There's nothing else that produces that much ATP. And so once that formed, and a cell took a mitochondria up, and there's already oxygenic photosynthesis going on, you're it's full tilt boogie, as I said before. You're really in a happy state. And I think so that's where the selection took place. So what slowed down uh, complexity was the formation of both cyanobacteria, oxygen, and the mitochondria. So cyanobacteria would have come before the mitochondria. And it would have to have developed enough oxygen in the environment for that mitochondria to be abundant enough, that mitochondrial bacterial to be abundant enough to actually be. So <coughs> photosynthetic eukaryotes uh, probably occurred first before the complex eukaryotes that we have today that act actually can uh, be heterotrophic. Mm -hmm. And that required the mitochondria. So that, that's, but I think overall that's the limiting step the cyanobacteria and then mitochondria following. Those are two crucial steps in the creation of complex eukaryotes. So anyway, thank you again.